tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. It was unthinkable. Just days after the cold-blooded attacks of 9-11, America faced another ominous threat, bioterrorism. The instrument of death this time, anthrax, a toxic bacterium that can kill in a matter of days, and did five times. The killer is still on the loose, and the FBI needs your help to solve this baffling case. A Texas teenager is kidnapped. His father has seven hours to collect the ransom and deliver it to his abductors. The fate of young Kyle McElroy hangs in the balance. For more than 20 years, Monica LeBeau has been searching for her birth parents. Her investigation has brought her to a painful conclusion. At a very young age, she may have been kidnapped. Perhaps you can help Monica learn the truth. At Texas A&M University, a suspected serial rapist is caught when his first victim has a second startling face-to-face -face encounter with him. After being released on bail, Don Richard Davis Jr. dropped out of sight. We'll bring you an update on his surprising arrest and trial. A woman whose family was ripped apart by murder searches for her long-lost siblings. Thanks to our audience, she is finally reunited with a relative she believed she would never see again. Join me for these intriguing stories and more. Perhaps you may be the one chosen by fate to solve a mystery. Tuesday, October 16th, 2001. <clears throat> Norma Wallace reported for work at the postal office in Trenton, New Jersey. Hey, this... She wasn't feeling well and thought it was a mild case of the flu. But as the day wore on, Norma became increasingly ill. She could barely breathe. Some 200 miles away in Washington, D.C., Another postal worker, Leroy Richman, was suffering nearly identical symptoms. He too became gravely ill. In a matter of days, both Norma and Leroy were hospitalized, their conditions growing worse by the hour. They seemed to be slowly suffocating to death. And doctors couldn't figure out why. But after administering a battery of tests, they finally came up with a diagnosis. Anthrax. What these veteran postal workers were told by doctors was terrifying. Like millions of other Americans, Roy Richmond and Norma Wallace were aware of an anthrax-related death in Florida just days earlier. Now they were suffering from the most virulent form of the disease, fatal 95% of the time. Suddenly, in the wake of September 11th, the nation faced a second wave of terrorism. Who would commit such heinous crimes? And why? Someone somewhere in the world had access to the deadly substance anthrax, the knowledge to work with it, and an environment appropriate for its handling. Was it an individual or the work of a group? Where were they located, and what were their motives? These questions plagued investigators and continue to do so today. For a nation still reeling from the 911 terrorist attacks, it seemed nearly impossible to fathom. The anthrax time bomb started ticking 11 days before striking Norma and Leroy on October 5th, 2001. 63 year old Robert Stevens, a photo editor at the Sun newspaper, died in Boca Raton, Florida. The cause? Exposure to anthrax spores, which experts believe came from an open letter. But the letter had been thrown away, its origin unknown. 
suddenly federal investigators were thrust into the world of bioterrorism. They were baffled. We don't have a crime scene in the traditional sense. We don't have witnesses. And we really don't have any, anyone that we can call an informant at this point. The same week, more media targets, NBC News and the New York Post in Manhattan. It is clear that the terrorists responsible for these attacks intended to use this anthrax as a weapon. But this time a clue, postmarks on the envelopes, Trenton, New Jersey. A swarm of FBI agents checked every mailbox in town for traces of anthrax. They found none. Only more questions. Why Trenton? Was the anthrax package there? Did the terrorists live in the area? Or were the letters mailed from the city only as a ruse? Whoever had the diabolical will and ability to put anthrax in the mail could easily have the intelligence to plot unimaginable false trails. October 9th, 2001. Two more anthrax-laced letters, again postmarked Trenton. This time, politicians the targets. Senators Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy at their offices in D.C. A form of anthrax so pure and concentrated, it was termed weapons grade. It was dangerous, dangerous stuff. It was estimated that two trillion spores went into each of those envelopes, which would have been two grams. One envelope may have had 100 million lethal doses. Unthinkable. Under the right conditions, just two grams of anthrax could potentially wipe out one-third of the U.S. population. Investigators came to a significant conclusion. Notes contained within the anthrax-laden envelopes were so similar in handwriting they had to come from the same source. But the content of the notes could be viewed as a clue or another ruse. Did references to 9-11, death to Israel, and Allah is great point to Arab terrorists or to someone who wanted investigators to think Arab extremists were involved? We are looking at three broad areas. The first being international terrorists, uh, domestic terrorism. We're looking at some of the individuals within the United States. And then we're looking at the lone wolf uh, as well. October 20th, 2001. Hundreds of federal investigators worked night and day to solve a crime like none they had ever encountered. Meanwhile, postal worker Norma Wallace fought for her life. Her temperature had soared above 100. She was in shock. The anthrax spores were secreting a lethal exotoxin causing blood vessels to break and the bacteria to pulse through her bloodstream. I felt like I was dying. I felt like I, I couldn't breathe. Once the spores enter your lungs, they actually attack the tissues and, and the lymph nodes and causes the uh, anthrax to actually uh, take possession of your body. Yes. Norma, you gotta read this. Norma knew her condition was serious, but the news of just how serious was alarming. I'm just reading about the survival rate. When my brother brought me the information back, it said that inhalation anthrax was the deadliest form of anthrax. 95% of the people die. So I said, I'm ready. Whatever God decides for me, I'm ready for it. The prognosis for Leroy Richmond was also grim. Suffering excruciating pain, Leroy laid helpless as his lungs filled with fluids. Worse, doctors knew their most powerful drugs were rarely effective in fighting this silent killer. I think I was about as near death then as I ever was gonna get. My breathing had become so shallow that I was actually panting like a dog would breathe. 
And I heard a couple guys say, man, he's not gonna last but a couple hours and that'll be it for him. But how would two mail sorters at two different post offices become infected in the first place? High-tech mail sorting equipment. Investigators concluded that the sheer speed of 30,000 envelopes per hour flying through a sorter could send millions of anthrax spores into the air. Routine machine maintenance using air blowers only made the possibilities worse. I looked up and saw all this dust and, and this, this soot and stuff coming out of the machine. And I just looked up and said, oh my God. And I said like that, and probably in that instance, I may have inhaled the spores. Miraculously, Norma and Leroy survived their harrowing ordeals. However, their lives will never be the same. I can't do all the things that I would normally do. And the diagnosis from the doctors is, hey, look, Mr. Richmond, the toxins will be in your, in your system for at least a year and a half to two years. The hardest part is not knowing what's going to happen next year or 10 years from now. You know, whether I'm, whether my memory's gonna come back or whether I'm just going to, you know, fade into oblivion. Despite their uncertainty, Norma Wallace and Leroy Richmond at least have a future. Four other anthrax victims weren't so lucky, bringing the death toll to five. October 21st and 22nd, 2001, Washington, D.C. Leroy's co-workers, Thomas Morris and Joseph Kersine. October 31st, New York City. Hospital worker, Kathy Nguyen. Three weeks later, Otley Lundgren in Derby, Connecticut. The deaths of Kathy and Otley were especially puzzling. Authorities concluded they had somehow come in contact with anthrax-tainted mail that may have been contaminated in the sorting process, but no one could say for certain. It was said that the lethal dose for a human was eight to 10,000 spores. It would suggest, by the deaths of, of the lady in Connecticut, New York City, that probably many fewer spores uh, led to their death. November 30th, 2001, a breakthrough. Experts determined the anthrax spores in each of the letters came from the same strain of the bacterium. The so-called Ames strain was confined to only six research labs in the U.S. That led FBI profilers to conclude the anthrax attacks were probably not the work of international terrorists, but rather someone right here at home. Someone who may have had access to one of these facilities. Loading these letters with anthrax required specific expertise. In other words, it couldn't be done uh, in your basement uh, or your garage unless you had some specific equipment. May 2002, still no prime suspect. However, scientific analysis of the genetic fingerprints of the anthrax spores revealed they may have come from one of two research sites, both under the control of the U.S. Army. The Medical Research Institute at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah. Today, federal investigators are in the midst of a controversial program to administer voluntary polygraph tests to large numbers of employees at these two sites. The goal? to smoke out individuals who might have information about the anthrax attacks. Meanwhile, with no assurance the elusive killer has ties to any of these facilities, the manhunt continues at home and abroad. That person has to be a serious coward and unable to deal with reality to have done something like that. And, I'm, and it's not just that it could have happened here, but it could have happened anywhere. We are in the middle of an exhaustive national, international investigation. We've interviewed over 5,000 people already. Uh, we've issued well in excess of 1,300 subpoenas. And every little piece of the puzzle helps.
<laughs> Day shift is over, time for the real workers. 18-year-old Kyle McElroy is among the most promising young citizens of the small town of Troop, Texas. He works for his father, Kevin, who owns a plastics factory. At the end of each day, Kevin turns the reins of the business over to Kyle. Despite his youth, he has proven himself to be an adept supervisor of the night shift. He's going to give me 12 cotter pins, hold me in place until the morning. Together, father and son have made the McElroy Plastics Company a booming success. Friday, March 10th, 9.20 a.m. McElroy Plastics? Who is this? Sarah who? Barney come in and told me that, asked me if I knew about Sarah. And I said, uh, well, what company does she work for? She said she wouldn't tell me nothing. This is McElroy, how can I help you? Kevin, we have your son. Take the 110 south, you'll find his truck there. Look in the truck for further instructions. Do not call the police, we are watching you. I'm not really in the mood for this right now. I'm thinking, you know, it's maybe a joke. <laughs> That's not funny. And I'm really not believing what I'm hearing. Put him on the phone. So she put Kyle on the phone just for maybe five seconds or so. Daddy, do what they say. They mean it, or they're going to kill me. The last time Kyle had been seen was at the end of his work shift the previous night. Kevin was now certain the mysterious Sarah was dead serious. Kevin McElroy had only moments to decide what course of action to take. Despite the kidnapper's warning, he contacted the Troop Texas Police Department. The officers were determined to keep their involvement a secret from Kyle's abductors. Following Sarah's orders, Kevin set out to retrieve the written instruction from Kyle's abandoned truck. As a precaution, Kevin allowed a Troop Texas police officer to follow him discreetly. The officer posing as a rancher would stop further along the road and observe Kevin from a distance. Both men knew they had to expect the unexpected. The truck was locked and Kevin had no keys. The first thing I was thinking is, are we dealing with a, a bunch of terrorists or what if while I'm trying to get in the pickup, it blows up. The ransom note was just where Sarah said it would be. The letter said that they were asking for $200,000 in $100 bills, and that I had seven hours to come up with the money and then go back to my office and that's when they would call me and tell me where to, to drop it off at. With six and a half hours remaining until the kidnapper's deadline, Kevin arrived at a prearranged staging area to meet with the authorities. The FBI was now in charge of the case. Garrett, retired. They want a couple hundred thousand dollars. There was nothing in that note to tell us where a cow was, uh, where to deliver the money, uh, or what means cow would be released. So we knew the abductors had to contact Mr. McElroy again. Ride with him. So I sent two agents with him. For their plan to work, FBI agents had to be present at Kevin's factory when the kidnappers phoned again. But they had to do so under conditions of absolute secrecy. All of Kevin's employees were sent home under the pretense of a major mechanical breakdown at the plant. Four p.m. The way was now clear for the FBI to move in. By this time, Kevin had collected only half of the demanded two hundred thousand dollars. Terry to Gary, we're inside. The next Please move be belonged to the kidnappers. 6.30 p.m. Hello? You have the money. We got most of it. What do you mean, most of the money? 
I can't get the whole 200. It's a Friday. The banks don't have it. The FBI worked furiously to trace the call. You don't have any more. The FBI had asked me to stall her. I said, you're going to get your money. I said, but I want to talk to Kyle, and I want to make sure he's all right. She said, he's fine. She said, you're not going to get to talk to him. Listen to me. Pay attention. Take the money you have. Sarah instructed Kevin to drive to a payphone outside a local restaurant. There, he would find a note directing him what to do next. Go alone. And the call was traced to a rural phone booth. But by the time the FBI got there, Sarah had vanished. The only course of action now was to follow her orders and take every precaution possible. Seven fifteen PM. I didn't see a, a note, or you know, I was kind of expecting a, a little brown envelope like the ransom note coming in. And so I went to picking through all that trash. I thought, well, you know, maybe there's something in this trash, maybe on a candy wrapper. So, you know, I went through it, and in the very bottom of that pile was a note. The note ordered Kevin to deliver the ransom money to a laundromat a half a mile away. He would then receive another call at his office, informing him where he could find Kyle. The FBI rapidly deployed his SWAT team near the back of the laundromat. We got a 360-degree view. There's no movement at this time. When Kevin drove up to the laundromat to uh, drop off the ransom money, there was a, there was a, it was a lot of tension. Anytime someone's life is on the line, there's a lot of tension. You want to get this done and, and find the victim as soon as possible. One hour passed. Two suspects approaching from the north. Beanie caps, blue sweatshirts, blue jeans. They're looking around, going for the money. Got the money, there go. At the eye, go, 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 go! One of the men arrested was an employee of the McElroy Plastics Company, a friend of Kyle's. Victor Ferreiras. The FBI learned his real name was Daniel Rios. Two alleged accomplices were also arrested. But the woman who called herself Sarah was nowhere to be found. The following day, the suspects told the FBI Kyle could be found on an abandoned farm outside of town. Kevin waited anxiously as agents went in search of his son. It was late in the evening. They asked me if they could speak to me. They had some information for me. And I could tell by the looks on their face that it wasn't good. And they said that he was, he was dead. They found him dead. It's like somebody walking up and hitting, but you can't feel it. You know, you, you think about it and it just, it just makes you mad. The medical examiner determined Kyle had been choked to death before the first ransom call was ever made. The FBI believes his abductors made a recording of Kyle, then killed him. Sarah then played the tape for Kevin over the phone. They say they learned that Sarah was in fact Desiree Dawn Lingo Perkins. The FBI believes she was a prostitute known to frequent migrant worker camps in the area. She is now wanted for murder. She is five foot six, and her weight fluctuates between 170 and 200 pounds.
May 1970. In a small Texas town, a fragile child clutched her only friend and waited patiently. Her family was on the move again, a routine that had become all too familiar. It was the eighth move to five different states in Monica LeBeau's young life. Eventually, she would move a total of 28 times in 15 years. Okay, can you get her chair? I would come home from school, you know, and there would be boxes everywhere, and I knew it was time to go again. Monica's parents, Pablo and Burma LeBeau, were older. Her two half-sisters grown and never around. However, the lonely little girl didn't question her family's nomadic lifestyle or why she was always kept home from school on class picture days. Monica simply learned to fend for herself, but it wasn't easy. I would get kind of angry because by the time I made friends, we were up and gone again, so um, that was kind of hard. Then at age 16, when most teens were thinking about boys in the latest fashion rage, Monica's life was turned upside down. My mother got ill, and I had to transfer my mother's medical papers to where she was in the hospital. And uh, I was reading through my mom's folder, and um, I read some words that just probably changed my life forever. And that's when I found out that my mother had a total hysterectomy in 1945. There's no way I could have belonged to her. Imagine finding out your mother had a hysterectomy nearly two decades before you were born. That she couldn't possibly have been your mother. And for 16 years, you'd been lied to. If Burma Lebo wasn't Monica's mother, then who was? The search for that answer has consumed Monica's life, leading her into an incredibly tangled web of lies, half-truths, and innuendos. What makes this story even more disturbing, however, is where it all may lead to an unthinkable crime. Don't be concerned with this. It is not I asked my mother, I said, is, if you're mother? not my mother, I want to know who is my mother. Oh, because this is my life. It has no this, bearing on your life um, whatsoever. We are your parents. And she got mad. Yes, it does. But, um, she told me that um, my mother was a family member. My sister? My sister. She really had a child. She couldn't my, take care of you. She why didn't you tell me? You I was shocked. You and that was probably a, the worst shock of my life. She said it was you. Um, is that true? It was true that Monica's half-sister was much older, 19 years in fact. But could she really be her mother? I asked her straight out if she was my mother. And uh, she said, no, I'm not your mother. I don't believe her. I am not She said, well, mother. mom just doesn't want to face the truth. Lies. And I said, well, what is the truth? Who is? And my sister I, told I, me I really don't want to talk about that, that Who is? my real mother <sighs> sold me for a bus ticket to New York and that she was trash and no good, and I didn't need to know her anyway. She gave you to your mom. Had Monica really been sold for the price of a bus ticket? Or was this simply another bizarre story about her birth mother? Monica didn't know who to trust or who to believe. And that's the truth as Again, she haunted her parents to tell her the truth. The more I ask, the more they wouldn't tell me anything. And I started wondering at that point, maybe something bad happened. Monica was not convinced her parents had something to hide. She began snooping around the house in search of any link to her past, and soon ran across a sturdy metal box. Inside was the very document Monica had hoped to find, her birth certificate. But the details seemed sketchy. There was no hospital listed, no address, no doctor. And the document had not been filed until the early 1970s when Monica was seven years old. She had only one place to turn for help, one of her half-sisters. 
She said, your mom and dad paid a lawyer $2,000 to make this false birth certificate. Was Monica's whole life a fraud? It now made sense why, growing up, she never had her own social security number, but used her father's instead. Chicago was listed as Monica's place of birth, and in 1990, at age 26, she contacted Illinois Judge Jean Scott in hopes of finding an adoption record. Judge Scott answered her in a letter. Well, she told me that she could not find anything from the years 62, 63, 64, that she had searched all the records that they had there. Chicago had turned into another dead end. Sadly, it all seemed like a bad soap opera, but Monica thrust into the lead role. For the next decade, Monica was haunted by the strange and conflicting stories surrounding her past. Still, she managed to get on with her life, marry and have a daughter of her own. Mom, I need to know who I am. And I think it's important for my daughter to know that too. During a rare family get together, Monica decided to try one last time to find out the truth. I'm your mother. My mom, at that point, was just angry, very angry. She started getting mad, and my sister, they just kind of looked at each other. Mother! According to Monica, her half sister suddenly became irate. I never gave birth to this child. She began ranting about how nearly four decades earlier her mother had hidden a tiny baby from the police. Mother, I had to tell lies to the police, and I did that for oh, you and she's Dad. Lying now. They were looking for Monica was stunned. In an instant, the past came flooding back. She remembered as a teenager overhearing her father talk about stashing a cardboard box in a bar, something about roadblocks, and the need to tell the truth. A picture began to emerge that was both ugly and sinister. The police were looking for The indication that I got from the whole thing is that my mother had probably kidnapped me. I really started thinking, my God, have they just up and take me, you know, from somebody? To this day, that question and others remain unanswered. Was Monica abducted as an infant? An appalling crime that forced Pablo and Burma Lebeau to stay one step ahead of the law? Was a tiny baby sold by a desperate young girl for the price of a bus ticket? Or is Monica's half-sister, not her sister at all, but her mother? I need to find out who is. I would be willing to go through anything, a DNA test, anything at all, to be able to find out the truth behind all this. If Monica's half-sister agreed to be tested, it would answer at least one of these puzzling questions. However, according to relatives, she recently left her husband of 25 years and simply disappeared. On another sad note, Monica's own husband passed away in 1998. He was only 31 years old. That tragic loss has only deepened Monica's resolve to find her birth mother. I am without an identity, and uh, I am searching, and I'm probably going to keep searching. I'm not going to give up. Monica was born with only half an earlobe on her left ear, a clue that may help unravel this mystery. And if Monica was indeed kidnapped, she believes it happened in the Miami, Florida area in 1963 or 1964. Previously, we brought you the story of the fear that gripped Texas A&M University when police thought that a serial rapist was on the loose. Now that a suspect is behind bars, the residents of a small college town can finally feel more secure. The rapist hid his intentions behind a show of normalcy. He looked like just another student out for an evening jog. But as he turned to go back toward his intended victim, his casual demeanor turned violent. The suspect kept that knife 
within her sight. And she had every indication at that point that he would use that knife on her. 30 minutes later, the rapist disappeared into the shadows. University police released a composite sketch and character profile of the suspect. Several months later, a knife-wielding assailant attacked another Texas A&M student. From nowhere, she said, a knife appeared and was placed against her throat. He threatened her. He told her that if she screamed, he was going to kill her, and then took her to the location that he, was, he had already prepared. This composite was based on the second victim's description. A comparison with the first drawing bolstered investigators' suspicions that a serial rapist was stalking the campus. Authorities papered the campus community with posters, but the rapes went unsolved for 10 months. The critical break in the case came from the first victim herself when she happened to stop for groceries at a local market. Thanks. Howdy, how you doing? Hey. Hi, thanks. This is a knife. The young woman was convinced that she was face to face with a man who raped her. Excuse me. You forgot something. Police would soon learn that the clerk was named Don Richard Davis, Jr. He was scheduled to graduate from Texas A&M in three weeks. When this photograph of Davis was shown to the second victim, she too identified him as the rapist. DNA tests confirmed the identification with 90% certainty. Don Richard Davis Jr. was charged with aggravated sexual assault and released on bail. Six days later, Davis disappeared. For the next five years, police had a fugitive case on their hands. In October of 2000, a routine traffic violation in Cleveland would be the beginning of the end for Davis. Don Davis got stopped on a traffic stop one day, and uh, when they rolled his fingerprints at that point in time, uh, that's when it connected up as a hit with Don Davis. And then that information just kind of uh, mushroomed from there. Davis was brought back to Texas to stand trial on the rapes of the two women. But before his trial began, he pled guilty to the charges. A jury heard testimony to determine his sentence. Don Richard Davis will serve 99 years in prison, pending his appeal. With the conviction of Mr. Davis, justice has been served. And I know for a fact that the two victims that we had are extremely relieved. Uh, they feel better, and I think they're probably sleeping a lot better now, because Mr. Davis will no longer be out on the streets. On a previous broadcast, we brought you the story of Laurie Delorme Magnan. At the age of three, Laurie was adopted under mysterious circumstances by a family in Kansas City, Missouri. The reason for her adoption was kept secret by all parties involved. Laurie had no idea what happened to her birth parents or her brother and three sisters. As she grew older, Laurie searched for her family, but only discovered that her mother, Frances Camarena, died on November 27, 1956. Along with her husband and son, Lori decided to look at the Kansas City Star on the day of her mother's death. Staring back at her from the front page was a 14-month-old Lori surrounded by her four siblings. That's when I first time saw the picture of me and my brother and my sisters, first time. The accompanying article finally revealed the dark, violent secret in Laurie's past. In the pre-dawn hours of November 26, 1956, Laurie's father, Alexander Camarena, murdered Laurie's mother. Laurie learned that her father was convicted of second-degree murder and died in 1991. But her efforts to find her older sisters, Phyllis, Rosemary, and Nancy, and her younger brother, Robert, have failed. My real brother and sisters, we lost both our parents now. Here you are, Mommy. And uh, 
I think they need me like I need them. Shortly after our broadcast, Ruth Crook, Lori's birth cousin, contacted our telecenter. A friend of Ruth's had seen the show and told her that her long lost cousin was looking for her birth family. It was um, a happy shock and very exciting to know that she had been found because everyone always wondered what happened to those children. My dream, my dream's coming true. Three weeks later, Lori found herself at her adopted sister's house outside of Kansas City, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the relatives she has spent her entire life searching for. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. This is for you. First out of the car was Lori's older sister, Rosemary. I just was just looking at her. I just couldn't believe it. And we were both crying, and it was just, it just felt good to hold her. And we just held each other. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, and I was just shaking when I got out of the car. You know, just nervous and, and happy, very joyful. Hi, Daddy. How are you? Soon, Lori was surrounded by aunts, uncles, and cousins she never even knew she had. This is my youngest son, I had three boys. As her birth family and adopted family became acquainted, Lori's circle of loved ones grew larger than she could have ever imagined. This is my sister Carol, my brother Doral. This is Rosemary. Hi. Yeah. I feel surrounded by love. I feel really great. I have all these pictures of me when I was a baby I haven't ever seen. And for the first time, Lori got to see a picture of her mother. Oh, she's beautiful. The eldest sister, Phyllis, was unable to attend the reunion. But she and Lori met each other shortly after the rest of the family reunited. Sadly, Lori's younger brother, Robert, seen as an infant in the news photo, died in 1982. And after our original broadcast, Lori finally located the last sibling, Nancy. Nancy and Lori have spoken on numerous occasions and hope to have another family reunion in the near future. Dear God, thank you for bringing together this wonderful family of families. We especially thank you for Now that we're all back together, that we have each other now, we'll write each other, call each other, visit each other. Nothing will keep us apart. Everybody's just all excited. It's all excitement. It's all good. For every mystery, there is someone who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you.